I'd like to call this meeting of Peter Township Council to order for Monday, January 24th, 2022. Mr. Larkin, please call the roll. Ms. Shanafel? Here. Dr. Barosco? Here. Mr. Curry? Here. Mr. Sligo? Here. Mr. Kozer? Here. Mr. Lewis? Here. Mr. Ross? Here. Everybody the grass with a bunch of allegiance? The pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, Indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Okay. First item of business is approval of minutes for the transcript of the public hearing held on December 13th. So moved. Second. Okay, is a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, next will be approval of the minutes of the council reorganization meeting held on January 3rd, 2022. So moved. Second. Okay, motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, that carries. Special reports, uh, first item, uh, Commissioner uh, Sherman. Sure, he's he he not here. Did not make it. Okay, that's quick. <laughs> next item will be the 2022 uh, Peter Township Road Improvement Program. Mr. Zemitis, think this is all yours. Thank you. Um, usually about this time of the year, it's typically when I give council what I call my road snapshot. It's like the State of the Union address for the, <laughs> for the road system here in Peters. Um, and for the benefit of the three new council people, I just wanted to just <coughs> briefly explain, because I know we have a long agenda tonight, how we manage the road network here in Peters. We have, you know, over 115 miles of uh, township-owned roads. We have... Uh, 33 miles of state-owned roads that crisscrossed through the township that I won't really talk about. Um, but we have, uh, every three years, we do a three-year resurfacing plan. And how we arrive at that plan is um, we, we rank all the roads um, and according to their, what we call the PCI, their pavement condition index. And we used to do this um, by manually driving all the roads and we had sheets of paper and it would have each particular defect, you know, tra transverse cracks, alligator cracking, you know, we'd rate the severity of the defect, the aerial extent of the, the defect. We had an old uh, computer program that PennDOT used to use called RSMS, Road Surface Management System, that we used to have to come back and crank all this data through. It would take us like two months to, to put this plan together. Um, a few years ago, we started using a company that was uh, formed down at Carnegie Mellon called Robotics. Um, a lot of municipalities use robotics. I see Harry shaking his head over there. <laughs> yeah, you've heard of it. Um, it's, it's kind of an automated process now where we actually videotape the roads and the videotape gets cranked through a computer algorithm and it can actually see the defects. And so it, it takes some of the subjectivity out of the, uh, the uh, rating system. Um, so what we've, what we've been doing the last several years is, is we have robotics uh, rank the network, and uh, we, we then we, we refine that by driving like the, the 25 or 30 worst miles of roads, because on a typical year we end up paving between five and six miles. So to rank any more than that is kind of uh, an exercise in futility. So we do that, and we, we try to arrive at like a three-year paving program based off of that. And, this map you see in, uh, on the screen is it's year two and three of the latest three-year program. We did a three-year program last year. We picked off year one of those roads, uh, year number one in uh, 2021. Uh, so we're on year number two at this point, and this is what's left. Um, there's other factors that, that come into play when we actually pick the, the roads to be resurfaced in a given year. We look at uh, if there's a nearby construction projects, whether it's a, a residential development or a PennDOT project. Uh, we look at the traffic volume of each road. You know, we have some roads that are low, low volume roads and plans are, are called local roads and we have collectors and connectors and arterials. So we, we look at that. We look at the age of the road. Some, sometimes, you know, age becomes uh, a factor. You know, a lot of these roads uh, that we get over 20 years, you know, we'll, we'll We'll try to stick those higher on the program, even though they may not be in horrible shape. So we try to take all that into account when we come up with each year's resurfacing program. Um, Paul, can you switch to the next slide? So I always show council this graph uh, every year. Basically, this, is, this represents all 115 miles of our roads. Um, 
The blue bars there, you'll see at the bottom, you know, I have zero to two years, three to five years. It's ranked in age <coughs> on the x-axis there. The number at the top of the blue bar is actually how many road miles we have in that particular category. Uh, the percentage is hard to see. It's within that blue bar. But the red at the, at the bottom, the red bar, uh, that's what we plan on resurfacing this year. So you can see that I've circled that, that top category, that 15 to 17, 18 to 20, and over 20. Um, the way we budget, we, we try to get at least 15 years out of a road. Sometimes we're successful, sometimes we're not. It just all depends on, you know, a lot of it depends on the, the, the nature of the underlying soil conditions, on how a road heaves, and there's a whole, you know, it's, it's tough to, to, to predict sometimes. But generally, we, we do get more than 15 years out of the road. You, we've noticed that, uh, and, and I'll present that here later on, uh, we usually get about 17 to 18 years average out of a road. So when it starts to reach that 15 year category, we start to kind of put it on our radar screen. So you'll see there that those red bars, uh, in the 15 to 17, we're gonna resurface 1.7 miles, and the 18 to 20, 1.35, and so on. So that'll just kind of give you a little bit of a breakdown. And you'll see that we didn't hit the mark on that 12 to 14 category. We've got some, some mileage that we're going to have to resurface that's in that slightly younger than 15 category. So uh, next slide, Paul. So this is the uh, proposed candidate list here for this year's resurfacing uh, program. Could you zoom out a little bit, Paul? Yep. A little too far, but. <laughs> you, you have two have options. Choices. No. Yeah. OK, well, I'll, I'll pick this one. Uh, what I wanted to point out was that 16.9 years is the average age of, of the road segment that we're doing this year. Um, that list on top represents what we want to put in our uh, base bid, and then we usually add, you know, we never know quite how the prices are going to come in uh, with, with a given year, um, so we put a couple add alternates on, on the program. But if the prices come in good, there's a couple more roads we'd like to add. That's, that's the top list there, the bottom list. A couple additional paving contracts that we want to come out with this year, uh, the rec center. This won't come out of the uh, highway maintenance fund, but Peterswood Park, there's a couple connector trails to the Arrowhead Trail we want to pave this year, the, the uh, rec center parking lot, the lower lot we want to do. And then as a separate project, um, some roads that are in, in pretty bad shape. Uh, I, I don't want to go into the whole uh, history of it. Um, but these several roads, we have about half a dozen roads that we used to classify as minimum maintenance roads. Laurel, Maplewood, and Pinewood Drive at the bottom of that list being s some of those roads. We're gonna go out for a separate resurfacing contract here shortly to get those done first thing in the spring when the asphalt plants reopen. So long and, and short could, of it. If I could just say, and, and the one thing is that those roads are, are, are complete reconstruction and the uh, budget for road paving this year was increased to accommodate that so that in fact we did not diminish the effort we had on resurfacing other roads. Correct. Very good point. Th th those roads will be slightly more expensive than our typical resurfacing because we need to we need to redo drainage systems, we need to add drainage, we need to widen. Those, those, those roads are in pretty bad shape. So. That'll be this spring. Um, total mileage that we, we hope to resurface this year is about 5.6 miles. Um, next slide, Paul. So this, this map, we, we try to put everything on one map when we pick the road program. I know you, you can't really see it too well on the screen, but the red lines represent what I just said we were going to put in the base bid. The blue lines are add alternate bids. Um, the green at the bottom, Laurel Maple Wood, that'll be under separate contract. And the, the, the one remaining minimum maintenance road that we have to tackle, uh, we plan to do that next year, is Longview Drive. Um, we plan to get that designed this fall for a, a spring bid next year as well. And on this map, I just want to point out, we try to put, if we know of particular PennDOT projects, we put them on here. We try to communicate with Pennsylvania American Water, People's Gas, Columbia Gas, any projects that they have, um, any developments under construction or de developments proposed in the pipeline. We try to get everything on, on a single map because, as I said at the beginning, there's other factors other than pavement condition index that we take 
into account when we try to pick the, the roads to be paved in a particular year. So that's what the map's gonna look like this year. Uh, I think that was the last slide I had. Well, I, I did want to talk about this briefly. Yeah. Um, you know, we are gonna do major road construction on Laurel Drive. At the end of Laurel Drive right now, there is not a turnaround that is adequate for large vehicles. This is what we're proposing. Um, Mark's been working with the adjacent property owner. We think we've come to an agreement, but we're gonna be talking about that in executive session with you in terms of um, what the uh, property owner uh, believes is fair compensation. So that's the, uh, the status of the paving here for this year. Um, the only two remaining things I wanted to bring, bring up is Mr. Lauer indicated we do have a, a kind of an expanded budget this year in order to tackle Laurel and Maplewood Drive. We still plan to do the uh, street rejuvenator and crack seal program that we typically do to those maintenance practices that we've been doing, extend the life of the roads and, and get us bigger bang for our buck so we don't wanna quit doing that. That'll be usually late summer, early fall, we do those programs as well. So that's it. Um, any, uh, entertain any questions. I know we're going to talk about a township tour later on. Paul will pick a date for that. Sometimes we drive a few of these roads to, to get Mark, more. it's not a big item, but I think an omission on this list is Galley Road. Uh, it's actually, Bob, um, it was on this year's program. The contractor just didn't get to it in time. So we're, we're going to, Galley's going to be first thing out of the chute in April. <clears throat> because it's by stark contrast to the resurfaced area yes. and our neighboring community. Yes. <clears throat> totally agree. So that, that, that'll be first thing uh, on, uh, Liberani actually is the contractor that's working up at the park and they got our road program last year. So they have a lot of paving still to do at the park. I'm thinking in April, they're gonna mobilize in to hit that and, and gallery. All so, right, thank you. Mark, you getting any uh, indication from any contractor regarding pricing due to the, the oil increases? Shortages and stuff. I, I, I don't yet. Um, I will say that, you know, pretty much every construction material under the sun went up this year. Pipe prices were horrible. PVC, you know, plastics were terrible. Uh, asphalt did not go up no. a great deal. Um, it, it's up, but not significantly from where it was a year ago, so I'm hoping that trend continues and we don't get hit. Any other questions from council? Um, I have one question, sorry. Yeah, so on the first map, if the roads weren't completely resurfaced um, or aren't scheduled to be resurfaced for 2022, will they be for 2023? Or? Well, that map, that first map is, um, it's kind of the menu, I would say, of what we try to, we use that as a tool to try to choose the, the, the plan for 2022 and then the remaining ones, We'll still be on the map for 2023. We'd like to hit them all. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. It just depends. Um, like I said, we, we use that as, as kind of like the base decision tool. Things come up, you know, roads change over the three year period. Sometimes they get worse. Sometimes there's a, a utility project that might bump that up. You know, we try to coordinate sometimes with Pennsylvania American and Columbia to get some economy of scale there for resurfacing projects. So it all depends, but that's the basis on which we, we try to choose from. Audience questions? Can you come up and state your name and address, please? Oh, sure. <clears throat> Good evening, I'm Joe Easton. I have a piece of property in Colony Manor and I'm here for that tonight as well. Uh, the type of roads you're putting down or that I've noticed recently in the counties is more like s stone and and tar, I guess they used to call it t tar Shot chips or something. Yeah. Um, that seems a little dangerous to bicyclists and motorcyclists for the long period of time. Is that the direction you're going in some of these roads, or are you it's strictly not. paving? We, we, we strictly do hot mix asphalt paving. Okay. Yeah, we, we, uh, Penn Knock does a lot of chip seal, they call it, tar and chip roads, um, just to, again, to extend the life of the road. And, Right. Give the impression that a lot of mileage is being done. Yes. <laughs> yes. They touch a lot of mileage. Yes, that's correct. Uh, but we, we uh, you know, on some of those minimum maintenance roads, we've done that in the past, but we've gotten away from that. Uh, it's just, it's messy. Yeah, it looks messy and dangerous. I just yeah. 
I don't want to fall on something on a bicycle wing or anything else. So it's just curious. None of that's planned. Okay, thank you. Any other audience questions, comments? All right, the next item is the American Rescue Plan final regulations. So under the American Rescue Plan, every municipality uh, has received grant funds. In the case of Peters Township, we're the recipient of $2,307,000, half of which we have already received, and the remaining funds will come to us in June of 2022. Under the regulations uh, that were initially published, non-entitlement municipalities, and we are a non-entitlement municipality, we're restricted to spending funds in one of four ways. Um, on June 6th, the Treasury Department came down with its final regulations. January 6th. Uh, excuse me, January 6th. They came down with their final regulations. And in that final regulations, they changed how um, you would calculate lost revenue replacement for government services due to COVID-19. Prior to this, the regulations required you to actually calculate out what the actual lost revenues were. And in the case of Peters Township, um, uh, based upon that formula, there were no lost revenues. What, what the Department of Treasury has said, and I think they're doing this to increase flexibilities, particularly for smaller municipalities, and to get them out from under um, a lot of federal regulations, is they've created a standard allowance. That's kind of analogous to a standard deduction on your taxes. And what they've said is that the standard allowance, regardless of the size of the municipality, is $10 million. And that becomes the, um, uh, the amount of lost revenues that you have, regardless of whether, in fact, you actually have had lost revenues or not. So, it is to the township's advantage to approach the American Rescue Plan uh, funds in this way because it gets you out from under um, um, federal regulations with regard to things like Davis-Bacon wages on, on construction projects. And it gives you absolute flexibility on how this money ends up being spent. So. What I am proposing we do is we pass, a, at a future day, pass a resolution indicating that we intend uh, to take the standard allowance and that we intend to fund government services with it. And the government services that I would suggest that we fund, um, as we did previously, is police and fire salaries. And so we take money that we would have budgeted of, of our own and use this money to do that. That frees that money up to be spent in ways um, uh, that are far more flexible and more to the, meet the needs of, of, the, of the township. So, for instance, prior to this, the only thing that we could have spent this money on are investments in water, sewer, and broadband infrastructure. By freeing up this money, um, well, you know, later on in the, in the uh, discussion uh, on the agenda, we have the purchase of a fire truck. We can now use that money, instead of going out and borrow funds, we can now use this money that's generated by displacing our own expenditures to purchase that truck. And so um, if council's agreeable with this approach, um, what I'd like to be able to do is at the next meeting, is to place a resolution on it and, in essence, do this. Well, I have a couple questions. Sure. Is, is this um, $10 million uh, in lieu of the $2.2 million that we're getting? No, that's not what it's saying. Okay. What it's saying is you've received a grant of, of $2.3 million. And if your grant that you have received is under $10 million, you can count all of it as replacement of, okay. of lost revenue. So they basically changed the use. Yeah, they, they basically the opened it up okay. and got all the little municipalities yeah. out from under federal regulation. Because quite frankly, yeah. I think we could follow those federal regulations, but I think there are many small, even smaller municipalities who, because everyone has received these funds, those restrictions would make it near impossible for the, them to spend this money. How much would we get? Just the two. Point two point three. You're getting. Well, what about these smaller municipalities that don't calculate any of that? 
they just got a number and that's what they have they, to do. they got a number just like we got a number they'll be able to do this same thing just say use that, it the way they allocate it the way they want, want to allocate yes it. okay because I, I was a little bit confused i thought like we were getting 10 million dollars no we got 10 no. million i thought that was kind of cavalier of the uh, <laughs> government to you know use tax dollars like that but it wasn't real clear to me and i appreciate you clearing that up for me so is it the consensus of council that that's an approach you're comfortable with yeah, you have for the last two months preached the four steps that were up there before, but I don't have any reservations about opening the doors. Okay. No, no. Uh, I'm okay with it. Okay, so we'll see that at the next meeting. So this money would need to be spent in 2022? Well, we've already within the 2022 budget indicated um, there are projects that we want to undertake because we have additional funds. So, for instance, what Mark just talked about, these roads that are going to be reconstructed, it's a one-time expenditure. This is a perfect place to spend that additional money. Um, we have an MS4 project coming up, a, an environmental stream improvement project that's mandated. It's a one-time expenditure. It's a perfect place to spend this money. But having, having said that, I think we would have been challenged to come up with how to spend the rest, the rest in, a, in a way that makes sense. And, and again, the example I use is the fire truck. It's a perfect place to, to, to spend this money. Um, it's a one-time expenditure, and it gets us out, out from having to borrow money. So to, we're going to have to amend something. the budget at some point. Then, right? we're, going to have to, we're going to have to pass this resolution, and at some point in time, we need to amend the budget to, okay. to show how this money's flowing. I think we'll spend it all next year. Um, I think between or this, this year, year and next year, next we'll year. spend it all because we're okay. going to say and that's uh, that's okay under that act. We've got five years to spend it, and um, I think yeah, I think this is the money we also want to use to do long view uh, next year. That's okay. I just wanted to make sure that we we, we will not lose it. <laughs> no. Any other questions or comments from council audience? Okay, moving on. Next item is audience comments. It's an opportunity for any member of the audience to speak to a non-agenda item for up to five minutes. Anybody will speak? Okay. Unfinished business. I'm seeing none. So item 5A is going to be uh, new business. Uh, item A is a consent agenda. So tonight's council meeting includes a consent agenda containing 11 items. These 11 items can be approved in one action rather than separate motions on each item. The purpose of the consent agenda is to move routine items along quickly so the council has more time for issues that are important or that may require discussion. So the items on this evening's consent agenda include the following. First, a resolution changing authorized signers on bank accounts held at First National Bank of Pennsylvania to include the current chairman and vice chairman of council. The second item is a resolution changing authorized signers on bank accounts at CFS Bank to include the current chairman and vice chairman of council. Third item is required acknowledgement from council of the receipt of the 2021 survey of financial condition. Number four is going to be the exoneration of Ryan Jarowski and Jordan Tax Service from their obligation to, correct, to collect outstanding 2021 Peter Township property tax that have been leaned and will now be collected by the Washington County Tax Claim Bureau. Item five is a special permit for uh, St. John the 23rd Parish at the St. Benedict's Church. It's basically authorizing trail banners to promote St. Benedict Church's annual fish fry uh, for off-premise off temporary signs. Number six is a special permit for St. David's Church to operate the Peter Township Farmer's Market from May through September on Wednesdays from- And if I could just correct that, it's actually through October now. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Seventh item is resolution authorizing the township manager to sign PennDOT highway occupancy permit applications, including the highway occupancy permit uh, required for fire station number three. Number eight is accepting the recommendation of the Peters Township School District to appoint Brian Geyer, the district's athletic director, to the Parks and Recreation Board for a term that ends on December 31st, 2023. Item nine is the appointment of Laura Cantwell to the library board for a term that ends on December 31st, 2024. Item 10 is the appointment of Matt Arrigo to the environmental quality board for a term that ends on December 31st, 2025. 
And number 11 is the appointment of Ryan Kennedy to the Construction Appeals Board for a term that ends on December 31st, 2024. Are there any items that any member of council wishes to remove from the consent agenda and discuss separately? Anything? Yeah, I'll make a motion that we uh, approve the consent agenda, agenda as stated. Second. Okay, we have a motion to second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, the consent agenda passes. Next item is going to be the approval for recording purposes of the McKay subdivision as shown on drawings prepared by J.R. Gales and Associates dated December 17, 2021 for Douglas H. and Jennifer A. McKay. All we're doing here is moving a lot line, right? Yeah. Yes, but if I could for, for the sake of the new council people, all subdivisions of land, whether they're simple or complex, go through the same process. There is a filing made uh, with the uh, township's uh, staff. Those are reviewed. If a determination is made that uh, there are no modifications or variances required, uh, they go to the Planning Commission, who makes a recommendation to Council. If after review administratively, there is required a variance or a modification, um, those will go to the Planning Commission and a recommendation on a modification is made to Council. A recommendation with regard to a variance is made to the Zoning Hearing Board and then it goes back through the normal process of going to the Planning Commission and Council. So as is the case here, this is a simple subdivision where you're simply moving a line, but the process, regardless of this or a, a complex subdivision with, with many homes, would be the same. So. All right, well, I'll make a motion that the council approve for recording purposes of the McKay subdivision as shown on drawings prepared by J.R. Gales and Associates dated December 17th, 2021 for Douglas H. and Jennifer McKay, subject to the Planning Commission's recommended conditions. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any other questions or comments from council? Audience? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, it carries. Item C is going to be the approval for recording purposes of the Easton Cottle subdivision as shown on drawings prepared by J.R. Gales and Associates dated December 31st, 2021 for Joseph W. Easton. It's a simple subdivision with uh, transferring a portion of a, of a lot to the owner of an adjacent lot. I just had one question, Paul, looking at this. Where does parcel A get road access? Is it yes. shown on, Seth, is it shown on there? Cause it's, it is it. shown on there. Paul, can you see that? Right here. Yeah. There's an existing right-of-way down to Bunker Hill Road. It was actually improved earlier this year with the driveway. Yes, um, parcel A in the back is completely undeveloped. The owner is listing it for sale, and he was having a hard time listing the property because nobody could access it. So mm -hmm. he, had a, he had obtained a right-of-way in an existing portion of his property goes down to Bunker Hill. They're right next to one another, and the additional easement's only five feet. So it's a little hard to tell in this subdivision plan because the lines are so close to one another. But it's this year. Yeah, it's that section right okay. there. It was utilized earlier this year to construct a driveway back to parcel AA. You said right. it's only five foot wide? There's, it's a five foot additional easement on the total width, and I think the existing your width bike is path, like, guess, it's not very it's wide. It's, it's just, total. yeah, it's just wide enough to, wide to get a it? driveway back there. How wide is it, do you know? About 15 total between the existing property and the additional There's easement. There's a 10-foot strip, I think, of yeah. fee simple that goes back to parcel A. All right, so that's and so And there's a five-foot easement that flanks yeah, that for a total of like a 15-foot access strip. So. All right, so that parcel obviously predated our ordinances that require the 50-foot yes. right-of-way. Yes. Okay, that's why I was just curious why that was the case on here. All right, then, I'll make a motion that we approve the... Uh, Easton Caudill subdivision plan is shown on drawings prepared by J.R. Gales and Associates dated December 21st, 2021 for Joseph W. Easton. Second. Give okay, a motion and a second. Any other questions or comments from council? Anybody in the audience? Mr. Easton, anything? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, that carries. Item D is going to be approval for recording purposes of the subdivision of uh, parcel, I'm not even going to read that, the parcel owned by the Peter Sash of Sanitary Authority as shown on drawings prepared by HRG Engineering and Related Services dated December 2021. So a number of years ago, the Peter Township Sanitary Authority acquired a property that has a home on it. 
for the purposes of at some future date of uh, putting in a pump station. What they'd like to be able to do at this point is to sell off that home and retain a small portion of the property that they would need to actually install the, um, the substation. Um, the one, when this was recommended by the um, uh, planning commission, it came with a uh, condition that was placed on it by the zoning hearing board. Uh, they had to go to the zoning hearing board to get a variance. And what I would suggest is that when we approve this, that we expand upon the language that was placed by the zoning hearing board. You know, it, that uh, parcel that's being retained for the substation at some point in time will be abandoned. There's gravity feed from, from that location to Bethel Park. And at some point in time, I believe that will actually happen. And so that is not a buildable lot. And I think there needs to be a notation that says parcel C is not a buildable lot for the purpose of constructing a home. If the Santa, Peter Township Sanitary Authority decides for any reason to dispose of parcel C, the parcel shall be reabsorbed by parcel B. The, the condition by the zoning hearing board predicates that if they decide not to build a pump, pump station, on some point in time, They'll build it, it'll get abandoned, and and they should be able to sell off that lot. Well, this was originally, I think, the Bertini property. Is anybody old enough to remember that? Or? Uh, I, I don't rec even recall that. So, Because that's how it came in here. And, yeah. uh, there was a lot of discussion about the concept of the residents not being enthusiastic over the pump station. Yes. So they're keeping the, that blue is the part they're keeping. Yes. And what was that comment you said about if they ever sell, if they ever abandon it, it's going to go to the other parcel? It's going to go back to the parcel where the home is, the parcel that it came out of. Yes. Because why? It's not buildable. It's not buildable. It's it's it's, it's, it's a longer trail. Yeah. It, it's it's a very small parcel of land. So really, there should be something that requires whenever they sell the house, there should be something in the deed that includes some reversionary language or something like that. So I don't know how you could do that though, Frank, right? because it would be prospective, right? Well, you'd have to have an agreement of sale that said something effective if, you know, a provision in the agreement of sale that sort of survived but, settlement that says that if they abandon it, it goes to that property. Yeah, but you, you actually have the reverse. The, the, the Township Sanitary Authority owns all both of these parts. Right, so if they sell the one piece, the agreement of sale should say that in the event that they abandon the use on the other piece, I would agree with that. That's where it should go. Yeah. Because I can see, I can foresee a situation where, you know, they abandon it and it just sits there. Yes. And then that's a piece of property that we're not collecting tax money on. Well, right, even though the tax it's a piece of property nobody, nobody claims and right. suddenly you have something right. that's in disrepair. Well, right. The only question I have, Frank, being unfamiliar with the property, would, would the owners who are going to purchase the new parcel and want it. Well, yeah, that's the other question, Partic particularly if there's a structure on there at some point or something. Or any environmental issue that they right. have that's to take. That's what I'm saying. I mean, I, I don't yeah. think that's a good idea. I, mean, I don't, don't think just, there is. Just, why don't we just approve the subdivision, let them sell it, and then if and when they abandon it, we can always just see if the people that own it then want it. Yeah, but what if they don't want it? Well, I think the concern we have is in the, what we see is somebody someday, as we know in that one lot that we just bought back, <laughs> yes. that they'll buy this at tax sale or they'll pick this up uh, and they'll go to the very, zoning hearing board asking for hardship to build some tiny structure yeah. on this property. And it may be 30 years from now when we may forget it, there may not be a good enough record. That's what we're dealing with on two cases now, I think, at the ZHB. Where we have the, we've created these unbuildable lots that sometime later are being tried to build. I'm not problem, sure how to restrict it. Though. The problem I foresee is that you're like what you said, John, is that if you put that language in there, you know, probably the current buyer is going to buy it. But what happens if, you know, they abandon it and you, there is some sort of issue with that property and they don't want it? Then why? Then they're stuck with it. Well, but I, but if you only put the language in the subdivision, I think you're okay because that what it does is. If they don't want it, you can't force them to take it. But at the same time, the sanitary authority is going to be stuck owning it, and they're going to have to maintain it. 
Can't they just I just don't it see them us? selling it off to anybody else Can't except them. Can't they just give it to the township for a nominal, and we can just keep it as open space? Yeah, well, what do we want it for? Uh, you know, do you think you want to give them where it's at? What, what, what I don't understand is why do they have to do this in order to sell the house? Is the, is Where's the house located on this? Um, it's located... Yeah, it's about right here. Yeah. I can't see so why do they have... Can, can I they mean, why can't they just sell it in its current huh. configuration? And can just, can they keep enough property to make that buildable? Well, in that's, the that was my point. Yeah, why do they have to put it in this configuration? Because it seems to me if they just sold... How big is the parcel? Oh, I don't think it's. I don't think it's subdivided. It's, it's technically two parcels. Well, it's two parcels. I understand that, but right are, is this big enough that you can build a home on it? I think you'd still be hard pressed. It's pretty skinny. I mean, it's probably. It, it might be 50 feet wide. Well, it's about. It has to be at least 65. The way okay. I'm reading it, but still. I mean, but you're going to have. At this point, it's a buildable lot, right? Because you're going to have 15 point, foot side yard setbacks. It's pre existing. It's pre existing, so it's a buildable lot. And there's but a two-story home on it. Did the VHB approve it like this? They did. Well, they what they approved was a, a variance that so allows it to. I think you do better created. looking at this. Usually, they don't give a variance yeah, that would yeah. take them out of compliance with our ordinance. You know, the existing whatever lots this left, they get it there. Municipal right. authority and not regular landowner. And the trail. Why can't they sell right. the whole thing and then? And then Santa Authority had retained an option to purchase that lot for a dollar. That way they can't ever develop it. And if the, if, if the sanitary authority wants to abandon that, they'll just abandon the, the, uh, uh, the, that parcel, the option, and then whoever buys the red part will own the whole. That works better because they can't develop it unless they exercise the option which then protects a future owner down the road from developing or from having getting stuck with a piece of property that has something on it they don't want. How big is parcel B? Um, I have it here. I got the thing. I mean, it doesn't, that's what I'm saying. It doesn't, well, this one probably better just to do it the other way. So, so really, I mean, 1.5 acres is parcel B. 1.5? Yeah. So realistically, there's a good chance whoever buys parcel B is going to tear the house down anyway and build a, another house there. Uh, not necessarily. Well, <laughs> but there's a good chance. It's a good likely. <clears throat> yeah, it's been place. vacant for yeah. 10 this, years. The no, second there have been people living in it. I'm the sorry. The, the sanitary authority is currently a landlord. So the, the current parcel B is about 60, and I was looking at the scales, about, what, 63 feet wide and 149 feet deep. I mean, you could certainly put a house on there. You couldn't put you know, a mansion on there, but you could certainly fit a house. My concern about this is if we approve this, I know someday whoever's sitting in these chairs 10 or 15 years from now is going to have to deal with somebody coming in here with exactly what you said. And trying to stick a you know a mini house in there or something and say that that's a separate approved lot there. Well, even that's though why I would put a note on the subdivision that would stop that from occurring. Yeah, I think that's fine. <clears throat> then my concern still is what happens when they abandon it. We're gonna we're gonna get, end up getting stuck with it. It's what's gonna no, happen. No, no, but that, I, can, I would but disagree with you on that. Why can't you just sell them both parcels and, take and, an and get an back. option on the blue one that they can repurchase it? For a dollar, that right. way they could never develop it, right? And and if if it's gonna if, if the if the sanitary authority wants to do something on that little parcel, then they pay them the dollar, and they're never going to be responsible for it. Now that's again, my, you know, my concern is this: if the sanitary authority puts something on there, and then they tear it down, they abandon it, okay? And there's an environmental issue. You know that the person that buys the red piece isn't going to take it. That's what I'm saying. And that's right. And then we get stuck with it. But if there's an option for them to take it, then the 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 own the the, the property owner's out of it, right? And if whatever they build there's going to revert to the sanitary authority, and it becomes their problem. Right. For as long as they hold on to it. Right. I mean, depending on what it says. Now, if it's an option to purchase, right. That's now, what I think. That's okay, that's what I think that, they should fine. do. That yeah. way, the the buyer won't or the owner won't build anything on it because it's subject to an option. And the whole parcel goes on the tax rules. Right. And the whole parcel, yeah. And the whole parcel goes right. on the tax well, until I the mean, not that that sliver's going to be worth anything. Until but. the sanitary authority takes it back and then it goes off. Right. 
I don't know. That's just I'm just trying to. Do you, do you give them like 20 years and say no. we have to exercise our right within the time period? No, because you don't want to abandon this piece of property for the purpose of putting this, a pump station there. You yeah, want them to be able to put a pump station there. Right. That, so, there's a lot of land that can't be developed right now without that pump station. Do you think it will go in pump? That they will put no. Oh, I think there will be a pump station, and I think at some point in the future the uh, pump station will be abandoned. But, oh, okay. okay. But I think there will be a pump station. Otherwise, there's a lot of land up above here that cannot be developed. Well, then if we just do that, we just don't make it revert to the whoever buys the red parts. Well, but it doesn't force it to be reverted, this note. What it does is it limits to where it can be reverted to. So if you own the, the red portion and don't want it, it's the sanitary authority stuck with it. Okay. That, that's the whole purpose. Well, it doesn't okay. force them to sell it to them. I thought they were going to get it no matter what. If no, it wants to it's, abandoned. There's only one place and they can do, and that's to give it to that property owner. If they don't want it. I don't think anything in this subdivision requires them to take it. Okay. So, All right. That for you, that's fine. I'll make a motion that we approve uh, uh, the uh, <coughs> subdivision for the uh, 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 Peters Township Sanitary Authority that was prepared by HRG Engineering and Related Services, uh, as we discussed here this evening. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any other questions or comments from Council? Audience, you'll need to call to the microphone. I was thinking of a copy in the back. Yeah, you'll Joe need to call up and say, yeah. say your name and address again, please. Yeah. Joe Easton. Um, I had a parcel of ground on Thompsonville Road, and behind it was an old sanitary plant uh, back when. And in their deal off of Elizabeth, they said if they abandoned it for 25 years, that it would revert back to the original owner. Well, after the abandonment for 25 years, they could not find the original owner. So their policy back then was stated that they, because it was a township and piece, it had to go up for auction. Uh, they had to, we had to bid on it. It had to be published, it had to be republished, and then it had to go up for auction. Now, I don't know if that helps you, any, but that's the way the procedure was 15 years ago. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Excuse me. The motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, it carries. Item E is award of a contract under the CoStars Cooperative Purchasing Program to Laurel Auto Group for the purchase of a 2022 Ford uh, F600 four-wheel drive dump truck. Okay, and, and um, item F is related to that because it's the purchase of the body for that truck. Uh, the Peters Township 2022 budget includes an appropriation of $120,000 to replace a public works department 2012 Ford 550 four-wheel drive dump truck. This truck will be replaced with a 2022 Ford 600 four-wheel drive truck. Under the CoStars program, and this is a cooperative purchasing program with, uh, authorized through the state of Pennsylvania, Laurel Water Group has provided a quote of $53,335 for the purchase of the truck, cab, and chassis. Um, Stevenson Equipment under the CoStars program has provided a quote of $64,550 uh, for the dump body for a total cost of $117,885. If, in fact, we were to place an order for this truck uh, tomorrow, it would take six to eight months to, to get here. Uh, so it's my recommendation that the Peters Township Council award a contract for the purchase of the truck for the Laurel Auto Group at the amount of $53,335. And it's my recommendation that uh, council award a, a contract for the purchase of the dump body um, uh, to Stevens and the equipment in the amount of $64,550. So moved. Second. Any questions from council? Audience? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, that carries. Item F, as Mr. Lauer said, is going to be a contract under the CoStars Cooperative Purchasing Program to Stevenson Equipment for the dump body on that truck. We so moved. Both. Oh, we did? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Motion. Well, that's, I don't, I didn't yeah, hear I, the motion, so. I'm sorry, I, mo I motioned for both. Uh, okay. okay. I wasn't paying that close attention. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, okay, G is going to be a award of a contract under CoStars Cooperative Purchasing Program to Stevenson Equipment for the purchase of an asphalt hot box. 
So the uh, township's budget for 2022 includes an appropriation of $45,000 for the purchase of acquiring an asphalt hot box. Um, the asphalt hot box is designed to keep asphalt material at an appropriate temperature. That's allowing the public works department to do uh, permanent repairs to road. Um, the purchases, uh, again, being under the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania Coast, our cooperative purchasing program. And um, it is my recommendation that council award a contract uh, for the purchase of the at hot box with a roller to the Stevenson equipment in the amount of $41,038. Is it under the budget? Yes. Yes. Make a motion that we approve that purchase. Second. Any motions are made and seconded. Any other questions for comment or for council? The only thing is it will never look like what's in the picture. <laughs> <laughs> only on the day it arrives. It will when you pick it up. <laughs> I don't even think it'll look that good on the <laughs> It's nice Peter's Township red, though. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's true. true. For a day. Questions or comments from the audience? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, item H is going to be an award for contract under, under the CoStars Cooperative Purchasing Program to Glick Fire Equipment for the purchase of a Pierce Saber fire truck. So, um, in December of the year, realizing that um, the uh, the problems of purchasing vehicles and equipment, uh, given what's happening in the economy, I challenged all department heads to go out and, and begin the process of getting uh, price quotations on various pieces of equipment. And quite frankly, our intention was to uh, purchase a fire truck later in the year. One of the things that we did the last time around that was very successful is uh, we were able to strike a deal with a manufacturer where we bought their demo truck. The, uh, the truck was, uh, was um, built and then used by uh, the manufacturer uh, in trade shows. And then um, later in the year, I was delivered to the township at a substantial discounted price. Um, those demo trucks are going to be hard to come by this year. The other thing that um, uh, Chief McLaughlin uh, discovered was that everyone is looking at price increases and surcharges based upon uh, the cost of uh, raw materials and uh, their supply. And so um, where we didn't necessarily intend to come to council this early, I think it makes sense at this point um, to actually uh, place the order for the truck now. Um, as I said earlier, originally the intention was to borrow funds to be able to fund this truck. I think it makes sense at this point to use the funds that will be made available as a result of the American Rescue Plan to do this. One of the things that Chief McLaughlin did was to go out to major manufacturers to find out whether or not um, they were able to either give us a demo truck or, or what is known as a program truck. It's kind of a standard built truck. Um, when he did that, the lowest price came in from Click Fire Equipment for Pierce Saber Fire Truck. Um, one of the things that's sitting at your desk is um, since uh, I did the manager's report, uh, Chief McLaughlin's had further discussions with Saber and Pierce. And it probably makes sense uh, to modify um, that that uh, purchase, uh, and that modification uh, represents a change to the rear end of the truck, uh, particularly with regard to the um, to the uh, extension of of the bumper out the back. So. Uh, Chief McLaughlin, you know what? I don't have in front of me that change in price. Can you? Absolutely. So that additional cost is about another five thousand dollars, which would bring the price of the truck to five twenty-one two oh four. Chief McLaughlin's probably in a better position than I to talk about what's on this truck and and uh, how it makes sense. But what? is clearly makes sense is that if we were to wait to the past January 31st, there would be a 5% increase in this truck, and then there would be an additional 
surcharge for materials of $17,153. So placing the order now is going to save about $43,000. So in addition to the rear end modification, what I did find out is it includes the striping from the factory as well, the lettering and stuff that, that comes on the truck. So it's not just a bare painted vehicle. It'll come with the decals and so forth. So um, and, and going through my email with, with their representative, it does include that now in the Chevron on the rear of the vehicle. So less putting the equipment on it, it, it will come now re ready to use. Typically what we've done, like when we had to, when we purchased the demo truck, once it's painted our colors, we then have to separately pay for the graphics to put on it. That alone was around $5,000. So the modification to the rear end was actually a, a very minimum change. Um, but adding the graphics and the stripe in, in this foul swoop to get it done from the factory is a bulk of the change cost. I have a couple of questions. Yes, sir. Um, is the price of this higher than it normally would be? Like yes. In, in the, because of COVID and all that? Um, because of material shortages, because of... Uh, supply chain issues. What I had found out is a lot of the major manufacturers had the least amount of price increases. Um, Pierce's is, is the leading manufacturer for fire apparatus in, in North America. Um, the other company that we dealt with, Rosenbauer, which we purchased our ladder truck through, is, is one of their leading competitors. Um, they're able to minimize these supply chain issues because they have full-time staff that manages their supply chain. So they're ordering axles at the 500 apiece. Um, and through this process, that's what I had found out. Rosenbauer did have a significant amount of demo apparatus available, but at a cost of when we would take delivery, not at when we would sign a contract. So they're forwarding their cost to December of 2022 when we would actually purchase the truck, and it, it, it would be significantly higher for a, a truck with similar specs. Um, the, the closest that I had found was uh, a Suffin, which is built in Columbus, Ohio, was about $20,000 more than this. So even though we're purchasing this through CoStars, uh, Mr. Lauer and I have done a significant amount of research to, to make sure that we're going to get the best deal. And, and, and Frank, but towards your... To, what to, is this replacing, and do we really need to replace it at this time? This is replacing a 2006 a simple pumper that was purchased. It was actually placed in service as our rescue truck yeah. uh, way back when. Let, it's let me a, jump in, and that's yeah. that's where I have a concern with this purchase in general. And I've told you this before. Sure. Um, back when the department moved from a, a box rescue to the rescue pumper, council was sold on the idea that it would serve as a spare pumper should the need arise. So you guys ended up having an extra pump truck, pump, pump capable truck there and nothing else is retired. So you guys are up one pumping truck. Back in the fall, you commented during the budget uh, workshops that once the first two trucks are on the scene, all that's needed is means of moving people. I think last count, you guys have like five SUVs slash pickup trucks sitting up there that all have back seats on them. So my question is, why do we need to be spending a half million dollars for a spare engine when theoretically, I mean, we were sold on there being a spare in service with the, the rescue. On top of that, we don't run a straight ladder truck. We run a quint, a quint which has right. a pump on it. So, and I'm trying to look ahead to when station three is up and running. And I guess what I see there is you're gonna have an engine there and then you're gonna have, you're still gonna have your rescue and your, your truck at station one. So calls that you're going to run are either going to be structural or rescue. So out of station one, you're either going to run the rescue truck and the, and the ladder truck along with the engine coming out of station three. There, there's really, I, I don't see any reason to run an engine out of that station to begin with. And you, on top of that, you still have an engine sitting at station two, which hardly goes out anyway. Right, so station two is our response from home, and, and we're not going to have a spare apparatus anymore. So when Well, you do, though, because you have... A rescue that has a pump on it that didn't exist years ago. It existed as a truck, so we've always had five major pieces of apparatus. Basically three engines, a rescue, and a truck. When we respec the rescue in 2006 for an additional $25,000 in cost, there was a pump added to it. And what that did was allow us to increase our ISO pumping capacity 
and allow us to now have the ability when a truck does go out of service to not have to borrow somebody else's like the city of Washington does at times or basically we're, we're but I don't see why would you have to borrow you only have three guys working at one time anyway they're not all driving separate pieces of equipment out the door exactly and and it's we're not we're not going to respond to a fire in an SUV first out the rescue can respond to a fire it has responded to fires it's 35 feet long it's built as a rescue truck first that can additionally pump a fire so when we have that issue we're able to use that front line so when an engine goes down which an engine will go down for a significant amount of time because it's never a, a simple fix we have that truck so you, you that's now the spare you just made my argument the rescue truck is its own spare instead of buying a straight rescue truck smaller municipalities purchase these with a tank and a pump on them same thing with aerials they purchase them with a tank and a pump and all of our surrounding municipalities actually operate with six large pieces of apparatus I'm proposing we still keep it at five when we open the third station and put the new truck there. So what's the plan to do with the current truck, Chief? Are you going to sell it then? Sell it. Yeah, we're not going to add to the fleet. We're going to replace the 2006 with the new piece. How much can you get for that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That is a wild. Yeah, it, it, it depends. So the market for that is actually high right now. Mm -hmm. um, but there's not much of a market for a 17-year-old fire truck. So a lot of the, the larger municipalities take the city of Pittsburgh. They're selling them after 10 years, typically, and they're, they're getting a higher resale value for it. Um, a target price for this would probably be $70,000 um, to gain about that. If When we sold our rescue, or, correction, when we sold our, our ladder truck in 2018, we purchased the new one for 900000 910000 We sold the old one for 100000 So it, it was also 18 years old at that point in time. So the yes, sir. Yeah. So that was, that was a deal. Yes, for both sides. Yeah, both sides. But the last, last pumper we sold was nominal. Amount it was a 1988 pumper that we... How big is it? Will it fit to, my driver? <laughs> well, it, I guess we, I'll go on my other question. Is it the similar wheelbase to the... Yeah, so you and I actually have similar taste in, in specking a truck, and, and we, we like to keep it small and short. Um, this isn't what provides the service. It's the people on it, whether career or volunteer, it doesn't matter. <coughs> That's what provides the service. So where we're budgeting and spending $520,000 on a pumper, our neighbors to the north in Upper St. Clair, reduced their budget this year and budgeted about $800,000 to purchase a pumper. This isn't bells, thrills, whistles, all that type of stuff. This is this is a work truck. Um, that's what we like to build, and, and the wheelbase, the stature, and everything speaks to that. Um, a couple questions just to clarify. So this pumper will not be, you know, we're not buying this for Station 3, correct? We would. We're not buying it in addition to our fleet to put it Station 3. We're replacing a pumper but the intent would be to put this new truck in that new station. So when we have station three built, are we going to have to buy another one? No, sir. Okay. And then, Paul, you would not be making the recommendation to purchase this if it weren't for the American Rescue Plan at this time, correct? Oh, no, I would be making um, the recommendation uh, to purchase this. It's in the budget. It's in the budget to be financed with borrowing. That's the only difference. That's the only difference. Well, I think the timing is different with regard to the forty-three thousand. What? Uh, yes. Advantage of doing it. We right might now. be buying this. Oh, I anticipated that we would be buying this slightly later in the year than now, but we were. The intention always was to purchase this truck this year. The one thing that I will point out is that um, that I did not mention is that this amount exceeds the amount that we have in the budget. We budgeted it, this at five hundred thousand, but that. That difference in price is a reflection of the the increase. Um, well, actually, in the case of Pierce, there were two increases for last year for um, the impact of uh, increase in prices on, on aluminum. And uh, again, if we don't do something, you're going you're to get hit with that again. Well, yeah. My argument, though, entirely is that I, th I think that we have probably one too many trucks there. So in my opinion, we're spending $515,000 more than we should be spending. Um, I mean, how many times in the past year has that, I guess, Wagon 64 gone out for a fire in Peters? I mean, I know you guys run up to the city of Washington, but. 
Uh, it, it runs, I, I don't have those stats in front of me, but especially when we open a new fire station, to have to put a vehicle down there, there will be a significant amount of usage from it. Yeah, but you'll still have one engine there, one engine at station two, and then three pumping vehicles at station one for three guys. It, it just, it, it never made sense to me. It still doesn't. Uh, I mean, I'm opposed to moving forward. I'm not saying to get rid of the truck that's there right now, as far as I'm concerned, to keep, keep it and for however long it, you know, until it nickel and dimes you. But as you start running it, a 2006, if we put it in frontline service, which it would be at station three, in frontline service, a 2006 is going to start nickeling and diming you about the well, day after you. Perhaps the one at station two ought to go to station three and put the oldest one at station three. It would be the second oldest, and, and you'd probably have the same thing. That's a 2010. Um, again, I'm, I'm, Chief, I'm not the type of yeah. person that, that wants over and above frills and thrills. This is, we're operating with five large pieces of apparatus, North Germain, Cecil, Upper St. Clair, Bethel I'm, Park, it, have I six. I don't care what everybody else does. That's, that's the thing. I mean, it's, not, it's not about keeping up with the Joneses or something like that. It's about being better than them, not spending what they do, making sure our costs are confined and, and, and really delivering the best product for the least amount of money. Chief, what, what would the maintenance be on that, the 2006 truck if you kept it on a yearly basis? I mean, so once it hits 20 years of service, it has to have a major refurbishment for it to be even considered NFPA compliant. So a refurbishment of that would probably be north of $100,000. Rough guess. By the time you get 100000 to 70 when you sell it, you can almost take that off the top of 520. So in, in exactly right. Once, once we're, just like we, we repave roads yeah. on, a, on a typical schedule, once fire apparatus or anything gets above 17 years old, it, you're, you're really starting to see. If you wear and tear a road for 17 years, the, the, the fire truck experience is the same thing. And, and like Mr. Steigl said, not every truck is going out to every single call that we have. But to divide the amount of services that we provide, our rescue truck has a tank and a pump on it. It has a smaller tank than the other pumpers do, and it has less hose on it than the other pumpers do because its job is to be a rescue truck. But in case things go south, we're down a truck, we can use that as our spare. What, did, what year is the current engine one? The one that sits at Station 1 is a 2018. That's the so one we purchased as a demo. The one that goes to, to Station 3, and then you guys run the crew at Station 1 is going to be your specialized equipment, either your truck or your rescue. Because the, you know, if you're running simultaneously, um, if it's a rescue call, obviously you want the rescue. If it's structural, you probably want to take the, the truck out. And, and remember, the rescue vehicle at 35 feet with all of its rescue equipment on it, it's heavier, it's bigger. The more wear and tear, the more runs that it goes on, the more it's going to break down as well. So spreading the amount of calls that we have over the five large apparatus that we have then I guess is ideal. going forward with that rescue, we need to consider going back to the straight rescue and not, not having the rescue. For the no, nominal cost of a pump and a tank, it, it, yeah, I, I, I don't want to handcuff ourselves like that. Up, but, and that. That's where I'm at with it, but I just don't think it's a good time anyway. The increase is, and there's a lot of unknowns right now. How long would it take to have the truck delivered, Chief? So the contract's going to say 16 months because that's when they're going to not take a penalty under. That is the lowest that we've seen. Most of them are, are 18 to 24 months minimum. Um, but there are build slots available to get this delivered by the end of the year. So if we approve this purchase today, we're not spending this money. We would spend, what the contract say, 200 some odd thousand to prepay the chassis. You take an $8,000 discount and you pay the rest upon delivery of the truck. So, But even the prepaying the chassis, down the road it's yeah. october yeah. Mm -hmm. october 2022 with a hopeful delivery date of, of december 2022 or january 2023 well i've listened on both sides and i certainly don't know enough to be an advocate or a opponent of the idea of purchasing but i i'm in favor of making the motion to purchase from glick the Sabre fire truck in the amount of 515. No, 521. 21. 21. 21. Uh, the number over here, 521 204. See if anybody seconds it. I'll second it. Okay, a motion and a second. Any other questions or comments from council? Audience? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Okay. Okay, moving on. 
Award of a contract under CoStar's Cooperative Purchasing Program to AEC Group for a wireless network equipment. So um, the 2020 budget includes an appropriation of 175000 for replacing and expanding the township's existing wireless network. Much of the current equipment on the wireless network is over 10 years old. And as of right now, not all the buildings have current, currently have access. Um, this is the intention of this project is to create a, a comprehensive solution uh, for all existing buildings using a shared, shared configuration. This will serve as the backbone uh, for the proposed uh, phone system that is to be purchased. Um, uh, we were presented with a couple options in terms of uh, sources of equipment. It's uh, our recommendation and AC Group's recommendation, um, and they are our AT uh, support provider that we award a contract uh, to them uh, using Cisco equipment uh, in the amount of $126,772.30. Will we be using American Rescue Funds for this? We will be using yes. funds that will be freed up by the American Rescue yeah. Funds for this. Yes. Yeah, and the one point I would make, um, this project, in addition to replacing in existing areas, I mean, you're actually adding some Wi-Fi service outside of the library that they can use for outdoor programming in the summer. Uh, the Public Works Department and the tennis facility will actually also have Wi-Fi under this, which they do not have currently. So it's, it, is, it does expand in certain areas. Does it improve the Wi-Fi at the um, rec center? Yes. 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 And, and, and there and down at the public works garage, the value of that, at least in the interim, will be it'll be allow people to use their cell phones on the wireless network to be able to call out. Because right now you go into the into the uh, rec center for many carriers, it's impossible to do a call there. Yeah. So. Is this the only vendor that bid? It's done under the it's done under the uh, cooperative purchasing uh, uh, program. This is the only vendor where we got quotes off of. These are discounts off of manufacturers' suggested price. That's what the CoStars program is about. Okay. And I, I got another question. I noticed in the paragraph in here, I don't know where it is. I know I saw it when I was looking at this before. It says something about. Um, uh, something about maybe where did I see that? It has something to say. Where they they said that be, that that the Cisco system would be a, would be better integrating with uh, yeah with the potential phone, phone systems. systems. Yes. One of the things in addition to that uh, comment from AEC, we reached out to Tower Engineering who are doing the specifications for the phone system. And they agree, oh, they think the, the, the compatibility with, the, with any phone system we may end up with will be better with, with the Cisco equipment. The other reason why I think AEC is recommending Cisco is that we do have some Cisco equipment, particularly over in the police department that isn't that old. And we can use that as opposed to buying and replacing that equipment that's relatively new over there. Well, wouldn't there be a vendor that would do the whole kit and caboodle? I mean, to do the wireless part and the phone system? Oh, it, it may, it, we're going to go out and competitively bid the phone system. And like, for instance, AEC is a vendor that, that could in fact provide you a phone system. The reason why we're approaching this the way we are is that AEC is the third party support for our, our um, computer network and, and this wireless network, of course, is integrated into our computer network. They're the logical um, firm to do this work. Yeah, but why can't yeah. you bid the whole thing, uh, both my, parts of it? Well, and my concern there would be, I think you would, you would run the risk of running into a very proprietary system at that point where you would have both the phone and the internet installed and provided by one vendor, you may now be forced to work with that vendor for the life of both of those systems yeah, yeah, because... But if, you put one that's, system that's in, concern, if, okay. if you put one system in and then you go out for the phone system mm -hmm. and it's not compatible, you're losing bids that way. No, well, but first of all, Cisco's potential a, bids. They Fisco's could be lower a, than... Fisco, Cisco is a standard for wireless providers. Yeah. My concern is that with our computer network, we've had great success limiting 
um, the modifications of that system to our third party vendor. I, I would get concerned if we brought somebody else in who is, is changing configurations within our computer system to accommodate the wireless network other than AEC because we hold them responsible for keeping the network up and running. The phone system, on the other hand, stacks on top of this. The thing about Cisco is it's it's a recognized national provider. I think it's a standard that, that I think most internet phone services are going to be able to, to be compatible with. Okay. Now that $126,000 figure, does that include the labor? That's the equipment. Yeah. So we don't know what the labor is going to be, right? It's, we actually have a quote on that. It's, it, it could be as much as another twenty thousand, and somewhere between. Yeah, it's, it's not, some, somewhere between twenty and thirty. They said it would probably be on the lower end of twenty. Yeah. It's, so it's, who, it's, who's the install? Is it the same it's AEC. company? Yeah, it's AEC. AEC group. Yes. So aren't we getting pigeonholed to respond to uh, Ryan's comment with the same people? The with I the same know. systems that they're selling us? Hmm. I, would, I wouldn't characterize it that way. What I would characterize it is that the, that the firm that does your third-party support of our computer system is the same firm that's going to do this. Right, but that could change, right? Oh, it could in the future. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is we're under contract with AEC to do this support going forward. And, it, it, and while they're there doing the support, that's who we should be using as opposed to bringing somebody else in. Yeah, I don't see the issue. I mean, I'm not particularly endowed with Cisco's equipment. I mean, we've had it in our office, we've taken it out. But I don't think our IT department made an improvement when they took it out. <laughs> I, I'm not saying I'm opposed to it. I was just trying to flush out mm -hmm. the issue is like why you wouldn't get a better deal if you bid the whole system, everything, as opposed to, you know. Oh, I understand what you're saying. It's mm -hmm. like buying a car and then yeah. saying, well, now I want to bid on the engine. You know, I mean, you're going to get a better price if you buy the car. It's just not the frame and everything except for the engine. I mean, it's, I, I just don't mm -hmm. like, I don't understand why we were doing it piecemeal as opposed to just a global everything, labor, you know, equipment, it's, you know, everything. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, I understand what you're saying, and I, I just, I just was questioning why we're doing it this way. Fair. Anybody care to make a motion? Yeah, I'll make a motion to award the contract under CoStar's Cooperative Purchasing Program to AEC Group for the purchase hardware and software necessary to upgrade Township's wireless network. Second, anybody? I'll second. Okay, I've got a motion and a second. Any other questions, comments? Council or the audience? Okay, that said, all those in, set, in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? It carries, and item J is going to be the renewal of various insurance coverages for automobile fire liability for 2022. Yes, so one of the things that the township does uh, every three years is to uh, bid its insurance coverage that makes Peter Township relatively unique among municipalities. Uh, we are in the final year of that three-year cycle. The insurance premium uh, for this year is $134,978. Uh, this is an increase in premium $9,883 um, over what we paid in 2021. Some of that is a reflection of uh, increased uh, equipment that is being insured. I think some of it's uh, simply a reflection of the market. Um, in uh, 2022, we appropriated $140,000 for liability insurance. Uh, we have another policy for cyber insurance that comes due in the middle of the year. I think we'll be slightly over that 140,000, but but not by much. So right, I'll make a motion that we renew the. Uh, I'll make a motion that Peters Township Council renew its insurance policy with Zurich American Guarantee. Zach. Zach. Okay, a motion and a second. Any other questions, comments from the audience? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Okay. Well, are we going to be rebidding these? Next year. For in fact, 
towards the end. In fact, of we we uh, use a uh, consultant to help us putting those bid specs together. We've already yeah. have her under contract. Okay, and she's going to begin that work. Yeah. Thank you. Payroll and bills. Mr. Chairman, I've reviewed the payroll and bills. I find them to be in order. I move they be approved. Can I get a second, anybody? Second. So moved. <laughs> All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, correspondence. We have a letter from Mr. McLaughlin, who I see is in the audience. Mr. McLaughlin, you want to want to address the letter at all, or okay? I'm Joe McLaughlin. I live on uh, 951 Cagney Drive. I've been here um, probably for every meeting we've had about the deer culling, and um, I'm not quite sure, but he has ever gotten any answers to any of the questions I've ever asked. I know I have not. I sent a letter to Paul. Has anybody read that letter? Yeah, we saw it. Okay. Do you have any answers to any of the questions on there? I don't personally. Does anybody in the room have any answers to any of the questions? Uh, if you want, I can send you a series of answers tomorrow. I don't have a problem with that. You know what? At every meeting I came to, I always say I'm going to get something, but we wind up, we, not, we don't get it. Um, I'm going to go through a couple of things that I see that are a little bit unusual. Typically, our township does its due diligence very well. I'm a little concerned that we're not actually following the rules. Um, Paul did send me um, copies of the application to the Game Commission, and I appreciate that. But I also found out that the other night I got an email from the township talking about our current hunting program and how it's going to continue. Mm -hmm. Well, it appears to me that we mismanaged that hunting program, and it now has us in a position where we have to go to the sharpshooting program. Um, the other night I got a brand new but email. Can I correct that? Because I'm not sure that I would agree with you uh, in that a requirement of the Game Commission for the sharpshooter program is to keep is, that in place. Is keep that in place. Okay. So, but if we would have had a better program, we might not have ever had to go to the sharpshooter program. And I, and correct me if I'm wrong, Paul. When they make an application to be one of the hunters selected for the program, do they have to pay a forty-five dollar fee? I, I'll be honest with you, Jim. I don't know that. Off the top okay, of I understand you have to, you have to pay forty-five dollars to have a background check done, and I think that. In itself, eliminates a lot of people from wanting to wanting to do it. In addition to the amount of time to qualify, I understand the qualifying time, but the forty-five dollar background check seems a little bit goofy to me. Because I've had a few people call me and say, "Hey, I'd do it, but I don't want to pay the forty-five bucks. I'll just ask my neighbor if I can hunt on his property." Um, it's a little. I'm a little worried that the same people that ran that program are also the people we're employing to be the hunters. Uh, Seems a little goofy to me. But maybe that's the way I look at it. And I also did find out that part of that state uh, program, the township is supposed to be under a strict no feeding program for quite a while before that starts. I know Upper St. Clair's done it, Mount Lebanon's done it, and I didn't see anything in our current email that went out the other day about the sharpshooting program to educate our public <coughs> to not feed the deer. Didn't see it, and it says it right in the permit. I'm a, a big question I have is what, what size piece of property can they hunt on? Can they go in your backyard and shoot deer? It's a relatively small piece of uh, property that's required. I mean, as evidence of that, you only have to look to the fact that you know this same program is operated in Mount Lebanon. Yeah, but I'm not to answer my question. Is it, are, well, my, are they allowed in a half acre? No, my recollection was that they had to they had to be 200 feet. No, from, no one gave us an answer. I think they had to be 200 feet from a structure, unless the parcel was like it was. You know, it wasn't in an odd configuration. I guess it'd be lack of a better word. I don't think we ever got an answer. I, I think and, he and did say that. Didn't he say that? It's no. Safety zone for the existing or future. And what about the neighbors? Do they have to be notified? I mean, if it was in your backyard, wouldn't you want to, your neighbor to at least know it's going on, or do they post signs? Well, well, the neighbors will be notified. That I can guarantee. You. Well, how do they get notified? I mean, if we well, don't know, someone who's, who's requested a, who's offered the uh, a property up. Sure, I'm, I, 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 I will guarantee you that the neighbors will be notified. 
Because I would agree with you. Well, we think if that kind of activity was occurring, and that's great. But should there, home, should there be a list of these are the things we want our township to do before they go out? Because we're getting close to them being out there, right? They're out soliciting properties now. Okay. And are they soliciting them in the areas where they told us they had the most problems, or are they soliciting all over the township? I'm assuming that they're soliciting where there is a problem, but I, I'm not. Okay. I, I think you might. I'm not doing that personally. Okay. Well. They're soliciting in other places where they've specifically said there is not a problem. Um, so, so we have no set guidelines. It's like somebody said they're eating their shrubs. They could set up on their deck and shoot them in the backyard as long as they told the neighbors. But they, they're, they're, they're not necessary. Shooting from a deck, they're shooting from a, a, a higher elevation down, yes. Okay. Well, then answer this, Paul. Are they allowed to shoot on somebody's half-acre piece of property? Because I believe like, they are. Well, that could be a little scary. Um, and these guys that shoot, I assume they've passed the test that they're, marks, these, they're marksmen. These, these, yes. These they're are certified, all officers. certified by, with high-powered rifles. They're going to be in a neighborhood with a high-powered rifle, with a silencer, with night vision. These these are the same people who are performing this function inside of Mount Lebanon right now. Okay, no, and they are certified by by the uh, Pennsylvania to be able to do that work. And we have those certifications? Again, I, what I will have to do is I'll, I'll ask the chief, but I would assume that we do. But I have not. Have I held that in my hand? No, I have not. Okay. And I think when we were all told we were going to kill like uh, 100 deer. That was a goal. And the permit says 125. It's and what the chief Ish. told you was the goal was to do a hundred. Okay. Typically, when someone asks me, you know, am I going to build a hundred houses or 125? I better be right on in the hundred and, and not say I'm I'm getting 25 in here extra. Um, I, I I see this thing kind of gone through, not with the steps it should have, and I'm more than a little concerned about it. I think the one thing about it is that um, it was not approved um, uh, but for a pilot program this year. Uh, the police department is to report back to council both on its effectiveness and its cost before council will make a decision whether or not they okay. wish to continue this program. And I did research a little bit. We're, he's, they're trying to tell us it's going to cost 21000 St. Clair and Mount Lebanon spend seventy or 80000 that's because they hire an outside third party to do it. And that brings up another question. How do we, we buy anything in this township, don't we have to put it a bid out for services? No, because we're using our own employees. Okay, so then they're covered under our liability insurance. Yes, they are. Okay. I think these questions could have been answered before because I think I've asked them before. I keep hearing, you know, the township's losing its rural characteristic, but I think deer wandering around are kind of the rural characteristic. And um, I'm a little concerned with the liability, and there is no rule. You, no one can come in here today and ask you how close do they have to be to a structure. You don't have that answer, right? I don't have that answer, but I can assure you that okay, but they're gonna the start, police department does. They're going to start by the end of the month. But, but the police but Paul, you should have the answer. answer. You should have that answer. That's part I, of your department. You should have that answer. Okay. This is a big deal. Okay. It is a big deal. I mean, if somebody calls in and says, can they go in my backyard and shoot deer? You're going to go, I don't know, the police are handling it. Is that right? No, what I would be doing is directing the people that are administering that program, I would direct them to the chief of police who would be able to answer Okay, well, question. you're talking to the chief of police then about this. Ask him about um, to follow the rules, and aren't they supposed to be under a no-feeding program for the whole area? For, I will ask For that. quite a while. Paul, does uh, Chief Grimes have a copy of the letter from Mr. Murgogler? Yes, he does. Okay. And and we, I, like I said, if, if council's direction is you want me to respond to each of those questions, I can do that tomorrow. I just think we need to pump the brakes on this. This is a big jump, and not normally how we do things in the township. We usually uh, have all the answers first and cover our bases. And uh, you know, accidents happen, judgments happen incorrectly, and it's happened with the police before. It happens in public all the time, and uh, I'd hate to see something because in this program and other municipalities, there have been incidents, and um, 
like what caliber guns do they use? Wouldn't everybody it's like to know that? Twenty three. I think they, they didn't know, say that. They're silenced and night vision. I'm guessing. Yes. Yeah. You know. Joe, I appreciate your concerns and questions. I've, you know, before being on council, I watched the meetings you came to, and, and they're great questions. So I do, I would appreciate answers to those questions and presented to council. You know, and part of the problem is, is I will copy council on my response. To part of the problem is, is no one is real anxious to come in and say, okay, let's keep an eye on the police. They do a great job, but this is one instance where we've never had it happen before, and um, I don't think the township should let them neglect the hunting program that was in place. I think maybe it needs some new blood or someone else to oversee it. Um, because I think, for example, when we were at the public hearing, our police chief had no answers to me and the game commissioner had no answers to me as how many deer are legally taken in the township. They didn't know those answers. To me, that's a great concern. You're saying 100 deer when you don't even know how many are already being killed. When we asked them about the farmers, they didn't have the answer for that either. And you know, my research tells me minimally of 70 deer. Um, they didn't have that answer. So to come to council and ask for that and to walk away with permission is um, pretty unbelievable. I'm disappointed. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Joe. I think, Paul, we probably do need to look at uh, cleaning up that the hunting, uh, I guess the policy on how that's administered for next year as well. I, I think that uh, Rolling Hills probably should have been added as a, as a parcel that could have had guys on. Um, there's some other opportunity there as well, so we could look at that as well. You're talking about the archery program. The archery program, correct. I, I just want to state that um, I agree with what you said, Mr. McLaughlin. I mean, I voted no. And it, it was a combination of reasons why I did. Um, I didn't think that the, the, the first of all, I, I don't, I don't want to say that the archery program was mismanaged, but I don't think that it, it was really ma managed in the way that it, it should have grown and been more utilized. The, the, other, the other couple of reasons were that um, I, I didn't feel that, that we got really any real information answer-wise along what you said about how many deer are getting harvested off-site, how many deer are getting, you know, places we don't know. I mean, I would think that those are numbers. But what really concerned me was, you know, when you ask them, well, how many deer-related incidents there were, um, their answer was last year or this year, I think it was last year was you know 91 but they don't know what those 91 incidents are is that somebody almost you know touching a deer is it somebody killing a deer is somebody totaling their car and somebody getting injured and 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 i think if you're going to go to the ex that extreme and and and, and permit people to, sh to discharge firearms in the community i think you need to know those issues and those answers beforehand and, and the other thing that I thought was uh, was was odd was that you know last year there was a similar type uh, I think it was last year there was a similar type permit issued for uh, the nursery on Thompsonville Road and every council member that here was trying to figure out a way how we could stop that but yet you know the I police deny. you deny oh, that but but. Almost every council person was trying to look at a way how we could stop that. We did not want those to be discharged in the township. And I don't care if it's a police officer or if it's, you know, Jungle Jim, you know, somebody that has a lot of experience. Right. I, I, I mean, I just think that you need to know that before you do that. And did, I, and, and did you notice the police report this month has a comparison of this year versus last year? The, uh Deer well, it doesn't. Yeah, but when I well, asked them, they wouldn't tell story. me what the nature of, of those 91 incidents were. And, and I think that's in response to the concerns council expressed about that information. Yeah, that's good information. Yeah. Yeah. So, am I right to say that in the township website we should soon see the rules or how they're going to? The size they're going to be, and we'll, we will know the yeah. areas. No problem. I've been from posting that. Okay. Now, council should know those rules because I'm assuming they're making the rules. Someone else isn't making no, the rules? No, actually, the, the game commission is making the rules with regard to 
to the sharpshooter program. Okay. But I have no problem so providing. The, okay, information. that's not in the website now about the deer hunting program. That no, it is not. Okay. Would residents be fined if they're feeding the deer? And the, a lot of my parents know. I, 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 I don't know the answer to that question. It says right in the permit that the township right. needs to be under a lockdown to feeding. They needed to do an education program to the community. Not that that's going to work. Oh, no, I guess I'm not sure I'm how not sure that's going to work. I, I don't think we're out ticketing people for feeding the animals. I no, but they should be made aware of it. Yeah, know, I would if agree they're going to be hunting in McGrand Hills and <coughs> all the people are feeding them, yeah. they're going to have a hard, harder time getting them to their bait yes. site. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and what I really thought we should have done, and I know I probably drugged this on long enough, yep. but um, we probably should have worked with the Game Commission to get Peters Township included like Philadelphia is in the baiting area for the archer so our regular hunters would have a better chance in that program. Um, and we wouldn't have to spend 20 some thousand dollars, which I guarantee you won't be 20 some thousand dollars. But um, that, that'd be a proactive thing. Maybe someone would uh, take, that, take that on. I don't think that'd be hard to get done. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Uh, reports. Anybody have any comments or questions on those re reports that were in the docket? Okay. Miscellane miscellaneous Township uh, tour of March 26th. I'm just throwing that out as a date. Um, it's for council to decide. Uh, we normally do do this on a Saturday between 8 and 12. Um, but I can tell you I'll be out of town that weekend. Can we do it during the week? I have no problem doing it during the week. It works for me. It's council that I think may have a problem yeah. with during the week. And we couldn't do it till like the end of April. I mean, I don't, we can do that. That's fine. I can find a weeknight. It works better for the rest of you guys. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it matters which month we do this in either. April, what was your date? 26th. That was March. That was March. 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 Weekend, weekends in March would be hard for me as well. Yeah, I Weekdays would be fine for me. Just need to know in advance. Okay. okay. See if we can do something in April or May, then once the daylight right. stretches. Because we need Does about three hours for it, right? Four hours. Four in the day. Yeah, right. Or like morning or. Yeah. Eight. Okay. We can make this work. They'll be here. I guess we're going to look for a weeknight. You want to do it in here? Everybody prefer a weeknight? How about the morning? Oh, you want to do a weeknight? Mm -hmm. I can do the morning too. This far in advance, I could yeah. set my schedule. Yeah. Same. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. How early would you want to start if it's on a weekday? Nine o'clock. I'm not going to attend if it's if it's on a weekday. Yeah, I, I, okay. I can't tell you that I could be there either. Because my, my schedule changes, and, yeah, and I, I might yeah. be in court and, and not know I have to be there until I get an order. And, I mean, if I can, I will. But I'm just throw some dates out there. And I'll, I'll throw dates days. out in April. I will throw out day, uh, weekdays and weekends and uh, Saturdays and mornings and nights. Mornings, nights, <laughs> yeah. All hours. Yeah. Awesome. We'll, 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 we'll see what we can put together. Second item is authorization to undertake emergency repairs to a traffic signal. Is that the one at 19? And yeah. Um, on, um, there's actually a report from Ryan that's sitting on your desk. But on the, December 9th, um, the pole down at Waterdam Plaza was hit in an auto accident. Um, if you look at the base of the pole, and it's what has us concerned, the yeah. weld at the bottom of the pole yeah. is actually separated. Um, it, that pole is now being held in place uh, by a cable that stretches back from the pole to, a, to the, those blocks. Um, we uh, have told our um, uh, firm, the Traffic Control and Equipment Supply Company, who maintains all of our traffic signals, to order to order the the. Uh, post. Uh, those posts are six or seven months before they'll be available. So it's going to be in that state. Uh, in the meantime, we have filed a claim with the insurance company. They have recognized the total value of the claim. And what we would like to do is um, 
because right now traffic control is doing this uh, as a gesture of good faith. Uh, we'd like to uh, authorize um, traffic control through a contract to do the repairs as needed uh, in the amount that's equal to the um, to the insurance claim. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Okay. Next agenda. Anybody do you have anything that they'd like to see on the next agenda? I'm presuming the traffic on Johnston Road will be on the next agenda. I don't know whether it's going to be on the next agenda, but work is being done on that. Um, I, do, I do appreciate the increased police presence. Well, seen several people pulled over in front of my house. In the last <laughs> well, Mr. Weeks. Mr. mudry has been out um, uh, doing counts and has been looking at traffic. Yeah. Yeah. All right. That's, that's the end of that. So, oh, we have a session. Oh, did you want to Oh, um, Don't be so quick. Well, Tom's been working on putting together a Zoom meeting on the yeah. for the library yeah. for the library on the 26th is the date that seems to be working for most people. Yeah, what time? Is that okay? At a time it's like seven. 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 Yeah, okay, yeah. seven's fine. Seven okay. fine with everybody else. Yep. All right. All right. Tom will send out a uh, a mm -hmm. Zoom invite to everyone. And one other thing, are we, are we planning to have Community Day this year? Yes. Okay. Cool. First meeting for Community Day is this week. All right. I've had a few yeah. people ask me, so great. Awesome. It's executive session. Yes. All right. Great. Thanks.